but we do it because it's important. We try our best. So I'm saying with everything we should start thinking like that. That how can we try and try our best in a way that we can do or we can try and feel Allah as he should be feared. And we should reflect upon his greatness, we should reflect upon his blessing, we should reflect upon all the blessings given he's given us. If he is asking us, fear me, and by that he means do what I say and stay away from what I'm telling you not to do, then this is something that we can all do better in. <coughs> You find that there's so much written about trying to build this fear in the hearts of believers. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, No man who wept from the fear of Allah will enter the fire until the milk goes back into the other. And this is an amazing hadith. Because what our Prophet ﷺ is telling us that if we can find it in our lives to shed a tear for Allah, to shed a tear out of the fear of Allah, then it will pretty much be impossible for us to enter the fire. Because Allah looks at our hearts. He looks at our effort. He looks at our desire to please Him. He looks at our concern when we displease Him. He looks how quick we are to repent when we have failed as believers. And remember, we know there's so many hadith about this, that if we were not sinful, Allah would have sent another creation to be sinful. Because He loves the repenter. He loves the repenter. This is why we know from the Hadith Qudsi that if you walk to him, he runs to you. Think about that. That you have a Lord that even though he gives you everything, even though he gives you everything and you may have done so many bad things, just make one turn to him and he is ready to forgive. One turn to him and he is ready to forgive. One effort to him and he will come back to you faster. Go to him a handspan, he will come to you and arm him. Walk to him, he will run to you. That is Allah, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. So for all of us, we have to ask ourselves, where are we and where is our Allah? Do we know Him? How we make any effort to find out who He is? Do we just tell our children you should fear Allah? And they're like, okay, yeah. But who is He? As, and it might seem strange I'm even saying that to you, but I'll give you a very easy test. Very easy test. <laughs> Think about something that you care about. Football cars, a country you came from, anything that you care about that you feel passionate about. And go in front of the mirror and speak about it for as long as you can. You might speak five minutes, ten minutes, half an hour, an hour, depends how good you are. And use that as your benchmark. That's something you care about and how long you can speak. Start speaking about Allah with fact and see how long that lasts. Not how you feel about Allah. Speak about Allah with fact. And it will be a very humbling experience. You'll find children, they will give you story after story. Talk, ask them about Ronaldo and they will tell you what he eats, what he likes, what he doesn't like, about the Saudis, about the Spaniards. Full story. So tell me about Allah. Test yourself, test your children. And then use that to start thinking, well, how do we find out about Allah? How do we start building a life where Allah is more in that life? <clears throat> Ibn al-Qayyim, one of the great scholars of the heart, he says, or he, he gives us three reflections which are very wonderful and important for us to think about. He says, fear of Allah comes from three things. Number one, being aware of one's offenses and one's sins and how bad they are. So if you stop thinking of your sins and you don't even acknowledge them, then this is not the place to start. Actually think about your sins and feel that they are evil. Acknowledge that who you let down. Acknowledge who they were, who you were sinful against. So you need to be aware of your sins. Number two, believe in the warning. Believe in the warnings that Allah has given about your sin. Believe in that warning. Know that if you do this and you don't repent and you don't come back, that punishment that Allah has prescribed will come upon you. <coughs> For example, we see in our time there's so much riba. Riba is everywhere. You know, everything comes with an interest deal. Like now, if you buy anything online, you'll always see at the bottom it says buy with Klarna, big uh, credit brand, or buy with PayPal credit. You know, 56 days interest free, 11 days interest free, 3 months interest free. Why is it interest free? Because they're just waiting for you to make one mistake and they will pile on the river. 200%, 300%, 400%, 900%, 1100%. 
I think, okay, okay, you know, it's not that bad, you know. I can buy these, you know, Jordans now, spread it on the four payments. You know, 40 pound a month, I'll be all right. But you know that there's riba in that. And what is the deal with that? You will go before Allah, you will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be given a weapon, and the angel will say, go fight him. Who's ready to fight Allah? Is anyone ready to fight Allah? No. This is why Ibn Qayyim, he says, think about the punishment of those sins. And the final thing he says, that remember, remember the one that knows of it. And that's an important thing. So he's saying that you may forget your sin sometimes. Remember, Allah will not. You may forget your sin sometimes. <coughs> Allah will not until you ask for it. Allah, Allah, Allah will forget, but Allah will relieve you of that sin, free you of that sin, should you ask for it. Should you ask for it. And this is basically the, 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 the reflection here about repentance. That we will all sin. The difference is we will not all repent. We will all sin, but we will not all repent. But the best of us are those that will repent. So if you're a child or a young person, you know, let's say you're at school, you smoke some weed, something happened, you know, like you made a mistake. It's okay, go to Allah. <laughs> Deal with Allah. Don't worry about your dad first, worry about Allah first. You know? You see this all the time in, on Leeds Road. Leeds Road stinks of weed. Stinks of weed. Great Horn Road stinks of weed. Nobody cares. There'll be people that are smoking, taking drugs, drinking alcohol, even coming to Jummah on a Friday. And they don't want their mother to smell alcohol. But they'll be okay with Allah. He knows what they're talking about. So we need to, all of us need to make this effort to think about who we are sitting against. <clears throat> so this is trying to get to this point of fear Allah as he should be feared. Giving him his due respect, his due right. And you can only do that when you start thinking about his due right and you start thinking about your feelings. And then lastly, I do not die except in the state of Islam. And this is a very, very, very important verse. But how did Allah address believers? Address believers and say to them, don't die except you believe. Because he made it very clear, don't take this for granted. You have the blessing, the netma of la ilaha illallah the Rasulullah. Use it. Respect it, acknowledge it, benefit from it, but don't take it for granted. Just because you said it doesn't mean it will be sufficient for you. You have to mean it, you have to live by it, you have to make an effort for it. Because he's saying if you don't, like, don't die except that you're Muslim, <clears throat> you can be called Muhammad, you can be called Fatima. But if you don't live as per the way of Muhammad, and you don't live as the way of Fatima, then why are you expecting to benefit from it? If you don't actually believe La ilaha illallah, if you don't actually believe that, that doesn't mean you believe that there can be a God made out of a stone or a God made out of a you know a date. It doesn't mean that. That you just don't believe in him. And this is a big fitna for us now. There are so many people that they yeah, La ilaha illallah. But the implications of that, they're not necessarily there. Like I can't do this, I shouldn't do this, I should do this, and I you know I should do that. Praying the salah, making the zakah, making the hajj, you know, being good to your parents, being good to your family, having mercy on your wives. Things like this. Things that we just don't even think are, you know, part of who we are. But they are part of who we are. This is our religion. This is our religion. And the way the companions took their religion, the way Muhammad Sallallahu took his religion. Like I was with the Sheikh yesterday and he was telling, we were discussing this issue about identity. Yeah? Islamic identity. So it's something amazing. He said when Muhammad Sallallahu arrived in Medina, his way was to comb his hair to, he'd comb his hair over. You see many people in this sunnah, you comb your hair over. But when he arrived in Medina, who lived in Medina? There were the new believers, Al-Ansar, and there was the Jews. And the Jews used to comb their hair down. So for a time he started combing his hair down. Why? And he said because he wanted to make Islam not strange. He wanted to make Islam accessible, visible, like he's a man of the people. And he did that for some time. Just to let them know, like, you know, we're people, we can respect each other. 
you know, I'm God's messenger. He says, you know, we should get to know each other. And then obviously afterwards he went back to his old way. But I'm saying he made that effort. He made that effort. He made it easy for people to find Islam. He made an effort to do that. Like we have this strange idea of, you know, that we have to be a certain way, we have to be completely different from everyone else. Okay, yeah, we should have a difference in the way that we are, the way that we behave, no problem. But remember, why did Allah always send the messengers from amongst those, their own people? That's the Sunnah of Allah. We saw messengers always came out of their own people. So people would find acceptance from them. You don't need to look completely strange. You don't need to have a completely different way. But your actions should seem so strange to you. Like, wow, what is that person on? You find that, you know, bad tidings to the, the strangers. This is often mentioned, you know, this is true. But often we interpret strange as in bad strange, rough looking, doesn't look acceptable. Actually, it's strange that how amazing these people are. What are they on? This is so strange. Why don't we ever think about that? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to be truly from the strangers. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of those people whose example is such that it calls all those people to la ilaha illallah, that yet to have seen it. And it gives us the ability to be true to this trust of la ilaha illallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My respected brothers and sisters, we live in this time now where evil is open and is really the commonplace. One of the reasons for that is the people of good, they don't challenge it. The people of good, we don't challenge it. We let evil continue. <clears throat> and one of the difference between ourselves and the early companions, uh, the, our pious predecessors, the Salaf, the companions, was they took all of these problems as personal. <coughs> Communities to break up. Why are we happy for so many problems to carry on? La ilaha illa We want that not only to be seen in words and we build these mosques, but that the Islam should be felt, it should be seen, it should be experienced. People should see, wow, this is something powerful. How do we look at our families, for example? You know, you often see people say, oh, you're in Islam, the women are oppressed. The women are oppressed. Let's be honest, far too often they are. Far too often they are. Not from Islam, from Muslimin. Islam doesn't suppress women. Islam gives honor, dignity, mercy, respect before anything else ever gave it. Far too often Muslimin they do do that. It's true, can't deny it. What will fix that on Islam? That's the beauty of it. Look at our communities, how many challenges we have. How many single women we have and they have no one else to look after them. Big fitna. How many sisters now you see in their late 30s, 40s now, not married, never married, unmarriedable? Why? Because we abandon the way of Muhammad We abandon the way of Muhammad Our families are dealing with every facade of everyone else. Drugs, alcohol, violence. We should see that when you look at statistics, our community should be much smaller in these statistics. We're not. If you look at domestic violence, for example, you look at statistics of people that are victims of domestic violence, we will be the same, if not more. We should be, you know, there will always be some, we should be a fraction of the number. Because we say, La ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad says, never hit a woman. How does a man who says, La ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah, hit a woman? How do you do that? You say that he is the final messenger, you follow his way, he never hit a woman. You have, the, you have the madness in your mind to hate a woman and you say you're a believer? I'm not saying this is kufr. I'm saying this is weak Islam. Poor Islam. Yeah? Look at the way of Muhammad says, look at his house. Look at his house, the way he lived, the way he cared for his neighbors. We don't care anything about our neighbors. We don't even know who they are. He didn't have stuff, he didn't have food to eat, but he would be worried about someone else not having food to eat. We don't care. I'm eating. I'm going out. I don't care about you. Does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. And this is what I'm saying, my brothers and my sisters in Islam. We need to really look at where is our religion? Is it in our heart? And does it change our behavior? When we hear about the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does it change our behavior? It can be in the small things, the way that we eat, the way that we visit people, the way that we have small dealings with people. And it can be in the big things that are harder, our relationships with our families, how we have mercy with our wives, 
how we make an effort with our children, how we deal with our parents, all which are a lot more complicated than giving some charity or you know, coming to the masjid. A lot more complicated. You know, you'll be, you'll be tested in your life sometime where you'll have two loved ones. You know, like your mom's telling you to do one thing, your dad's telling you to do another. You're not sure what to do. Yeah? Or you have a problem with your wife and you think, what should I do? Do I listen to my wife or do I listen to the laws of Allah? Sometimes they're calling to different things. And it's hard, it's so hard. But we're all human beings and all I'm saying is that the, the challenge itself isn't the problem. The way that we deal with the challenge is a problem. Maybe you have a fitna in your life and you're, you, know, you have some conflict with your wife, for example. You know, this is the real world. But put Allah first. Find out how Allah wants you to deal with it. Don't go around talking to everyone else and reading on what Andrew Tate's got to say or watching this video about this person. No, try to find what the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. Make the effort and you'll find that the effort will bring its blessings. Because Islam, without a shadow of doubt, my respected brothers and sisters, has every answer to every question that you've got. It has it. The problem is, is we don't often know how to read the book. We've got the questions, we just don't know how to read the answers. And it's time we learn how to read the answers. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all the ability to be people that look for the answers in the Quran and the Sunnah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our families to look at the Quran and the Sunnah as a way of moving forward. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our mistake and have our mercy on our brothers and sisters throughout the world which are suffering. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring water in its due measure where there is no water and to relieve the water where there is needed to be relieved. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to support all our brothers and sisters that are fighting in his cause, that are trying to uphold the banner of Layla and Rasulullah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give every single person in this masjid the desire to have the responsibility of Layla and Rasulullah to call in the people and look at this masjid and think why is there not more white people in this room? Why is there more people that believe that do not believe in Allah right now? Why is this room not having more of those people? Because this is their right and we must give them their rights. Akumasalat comes down for your prayers.